We're going to be in Psalm 139 tonight. I almost expected to hear an audible groan from the women in the audience, because I'm pretty sure you've all been to a women's event where Psalm 139 was discussed before. And my hope is that tonight we can reclaim it, that we can reclaim it from t-shirts and cheesy coffee mugs and from scripted picture frames. I want Psalm 139 back, and I want it back for all of us. One of the verses that jumped out at me early on in my search to grow in wisdom was Psalm 111.10, and it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's an interesting, interesting thought, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, because I think that when we think about where wisdom should begin, we don't expect that it would start with the fear of the Lord. We think it should start with maybe the love of the Lord. But that's not what the Bible tells us. It says the fear of the Lord. And so then we have to ask the question, what is meant by that fear? Is it meant a trembling fear? Is it the fear that Adam and Eve felt in Eden after they had eaten the forbidden fruit? Or is it a different thing? And I would say that it's the fear that is described in Hebrews chapter 12. It is a right reverence and awe for the Lord. That a right reverence and awe is the beginning of wisdom. And I think it's interesting that even secular studies would show that this is the case, that awe is something that is good for the human soul. And interestingly enough, humans are the only not are the only mammals who are able to experience awe. I don't know if you knew this. Like your dog may get a ridiculous expression on its face when you get ready to give it a treat. But he's not experiencing awe, he is experiencing something else. In many non-human mammals, they're able to get goosebumps, but they're only able to get them when they are in danger and when they feel threat. But human beings are able to get goosebumps for another reason entirely. We're able to get them when we see something or experience something that is transcendent. And what research is showing, based on an article that was in the New York Times, is that this awe, this transcendent effect does something to us. It turns us from narcissism. It turns us from looking only to our own concerns and actually makes us take on the concerns of others, which is fascinating because it sounds an awful lot like the great command that says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which is going to be an awe experience. And then what? You'll love your neighbor as you love yourself. So it makes sense that awe would be something, especially awe that terminates on God himself, would be something that causes us to be others-focused, that causes us to embrace the great command. But I find so often that the way that we approach the scriptures lacks the very awe that it ought to. It does not generate the awe that it should. And I see this to be epidemic among women's gatherings, just to be very frank with you. Uh, It's interesting to me how many events probably each of us have been to where Psalm 139.14 has been trotted out for us. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It's supposed to be this verse that sort of solves all of our body image problems or all of our feelings of insignificance. It's the feeling, you know, it's after Christmas and your pants don't fit anymore. And so you go and you read Psalm 139.14 and go, oh, it's going to be all right. I'm a daughter of the king. And yet we've spent really no time at all focusing on the king. So is it any wonder that we hear these messages over and over again and they don't seem to stick? Is it any wonder that we keep trotting out Psalm 139, 14 as though it's going to fix us and yet it doesn't seem to? And so I sort of boiled over finally when I attended an event. I was doing a breakout session, but there were three platform speakers and I always try to attend the platform messages just to make sure that I'm not saying something that doesn't go along with that in my breakout session. And so all three of these women were, were speaking on a sort of a similar theme, and I guess they had not talked to each other beforehand because can you guess what all three sessions were on? Yeah, Psalm 139. And almost all of it focused on that verse 14. And so by the time we got to the third session and that sister stood up and started talking about Psalm 139, I thought, I have just about had it. I had heard every self-esteem message that I could hear. And she wrapped things up. This is when it got incredibly crazy. We're winding down her message, and she instructs us at the end of the message to take our hands and place them on our uterus, what's the, uteri, on our uteri, and pronounce a blessing over them. Okay, so I'm one of those people who, when the person leading worship on Sunday says, put your hands in the air, I'm like, "Mm, probably not. (laughs) 
Or if they say, lean over and shake the hand of the person next to you, I'm like, I really just don't feel like I should. So here's this woman, and she is telling us to place our hands on our uteruses. And it's this room full of women, and I start to have these two crazy thoughts hit me simultaneously. And the first one was, this is kind of an older crowd. I'm not sure all of us still have that. (laughs) And the second thought that was even more alarming than the first was, if this is what the women are doing, what is the corresponding blessing (laughs) at the men's conference? It was ridiculous. It was comical. And it would be funny to me wholeheartedly if it had not so made light of the beauty of a psalm that's whole intent is not to make much of me, but to make much of God. And so I thought that perhaps tonight we could just start by going through Psalm 139 and seeing what it has to teach us about the fear of the Lord, about the right reverence and awe of the Lord. It's important for us to think as we keep in mind the idea of awe, that we only feel awe at things that are not like us. Have you thought about that? The things that we just can't even compare ourselves to. Anytime that we can say, oh, that's like me, or I can relate to that, what does it do? It makes it smaller. It makes it measurable. It makes it quantifiable. But we experience awe when something defies explanation, when something goes beyond what we can imagine. And I think that that's what David is expressing in this psalm, Psalm 139, which, yeah, is written by David. Did you notice that? It's written by a dude. So why is it that the women have thought, this is the girl psalm. This is the one that we get to take and use to make ourselves feel better. It's written by a man, and he's expressing something that is universally true for both men and women and important for us to understand. So let's just go through this psalm and see what we can take from it, starting in verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. I am going to commit the common error of the women's gathering and stop at verse 18, but trust me, we will go beyond it. It's when it wanders into the portion of the psalm where it's difficult to come up with a decorating theme for your event, leading off with the verse, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. (laughs) But don't worry, we're going to get there. But before we get there, we have to understand what it is that David is saying in these opening verses. So take a look back up there at the top of the psalm, starting in verse 1. And notice the picture of God that David is building for us as he is preaching to himself about the nature and character of God, as he is extolling things that are true only of God. And what does he say? He says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. So he understands that God is able to see all there is to see about him. He says, you know, when I sit down and when I rise up, he acknowledges that God is familiar with his habits. But look what he says next. You discern my thoughts from afar. 
he acknowledges that God knows even the things that are going on in his head. Before they find their way into his speech or into his actions, they are laid bare before God. Verse 3, you search out my path and my lying down. He knows that God is aware of his location regardless of where he goes. And then what does he say? You are acquainted with all of my ways. And then he says, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. So he paints for us a picture of a God who doesn't just hold some knowledge, but who holds all knowledge. He paints a picture for us of a God who understands habits, thoughts, location, words, who knows everything all together about him. When I read this, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together, it makes me think about Google. Have you noticed how Google can read our minds? (laughs) Yeah, you know about this. So like say you want to go to Starbucks, but you're not sure where it is, and so you start typing into the search engine, where is the nearest, and what does Google do? Starbucks. And you're like, what? What just happened? Or maybe you need to go to the dry cleaners, and so you say dry cleaners at the corner of, and it will fill in whatever. And why is it? How does Google know? Google knows stuff, right? Is Google omniscient? No, Google knows what we're looking for, right? It has this database that it has built based on what everybody is searching for. How much more so an eternal God? He knows all things. And why does he know all things? Because he learned them? No, he knows all things because he is the origin of all things. So my grandfather was a nuclear engineer before we called them nuclear engineers, and he worked on the Nautilus submarine. And if you wanted to know anything about the Nautilus submarine, you could ask him and he would tell you. Why did he know everything that there was to know about the Nautilus submarine? Because he made it. And so when we think about the knowledge of God, the comprehensive knowledge of God, how does he know my thoughts before they're formed? How does he know a word before it's on my tongue? He knows because he is our origin. He is our origin. He does not have to learn. In fact, he is incapable of learning. He holds all knowledge because he is the source of all knowledge. That is not like me. I am still hoping to learn. I hope I will learn for my whole life. But as I head into middle age and beyond, I feel that I am already beginning to forget a lot of the things that I at one time knew. And that is a little bit alarming. And yet God is a God who cannot even forget When the scriptures speak of him remembering our sins no more, it does not mean that he actually has no memory of them. It means that he treats them as though they do not exist because of Jesus Christ. But he is not capable of forgetting because he holds all knowledge and he holds it perfectly. He is not like me and he is not like anyone I know. But David moves on from there, verse 5. He says, you hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. And here he references two more things that are true about God that we cannot say about ourselves. When we read this, you hem me in behind and before, I think the first thing that we think of is it sounds like sort of like a big hug from God, which that's appealing at a women's conference, I will say. We like to think about snuggle God. But I think what we see here is actually a time reference that you hem me in both in the past and in the future. And you also lay your hand on me right here where I am right now. He is the God who is behind us and before us. He is eternal. He was and he is and he is to come. And then such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. A reference to the incomprehensibility of God. That the knowledge of who God is, is too vast for us to comprehend. It is beyond our tracing out. We love to know everything about everything. Doesn't everybody in here love to be an expert on something? There's probably something that you think you're an expert on. I like to think that I'm an expert on the menu at (laughs) Chick-fil-A. I spent a great deal of time mastering it. I'm committed to it. We like to feel like there are things over which we have mastery, that we have the full measure of, but God defies full measurement. He does not allow himself to be fully understood. I'm not like that. Here's a lie that I tell myself. I'm too complex for anybody to really get me. They can't really understand what I'm really like because I'm pretty nuanced. And I really liked the way that sounded for a long time until I took the Myers-Briggs personality test. 
And I got grouped into one of 16 buckets, right? And so I found myself thinking, why are there only 16? Because I feel like I'm pretty special and I might need my own bucket. And then I read the description of my bucket and realized that it was dead on. Myers-Briggs figured me out. I don't think the God of the universe can know me completely. Myers-Briggs figured me out. Why? Because there are things that are generally true about us. We're just not that complex, certainly not relative to an infinite God. And David acknowledges that. He celebrates it. He doesn't see it as something that's frustrating. He sees it as something that is worthy of worship. Verse 7, where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. So now he begins to unfold his worshipful appreciation of the omnipresence of God, that God is everywhere fully present. And look at the way that he does this in poetic terms. First he says, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. So where would we point if we were pointing at heaven? Good. It's okay. I know you're like, I'm not pointing because you don't lay your hand on your uterus, so don't tell me to point. (laughs) If I ascend to heaven, you are here. If I make my bed in shale, so shale is the grave, so where would that be? Good, you're doing so well. I'm really proud of you. So if I ascend to heaven, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. So God is high and God is low. And now look at this next one. If I take the wings of the morning, where does the sun rise? In the east. Where is, I, don't, I have no idea what the orientation of this building is. Anybody know where east is from here? Oh, great. This is east over here. So if I take the wings of the morning, and then what does he say next? And dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Now we read uttermost parts of the sea, and we want to point down again, right? But where is David writing this psalm from? He's in Israel. And where is the sea relative to where he is at that time? It's in the west, right? So what has he just done here? He's painted a word picture. God is high, and he is low. He is east, and he is west. He is everywhere fully present. Verse 10, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. He is high and low. He is east and west. Darkness and light are the same to him. Nothing is hidden from him. He is everywhere fully present. I'm not like that. I wish I could be sometimes. I don't want to be everywhere fully present, but there are many times where I'd like to be in two places at once, or three, depending on where all of my four children are at any given time. Sometimes I want to be at four places at one time. And we have this thing with moms where we want to have eyes in the back of our head, right? We just want to be able to know everything that's going on. And yet God has no need to wonder what's going on in any other location because he is everywhere fully present. I remember when I was in college, I took a trip for the summer to France. And one of the things that we were supposed to do was keep a log of everything that we had done so that we would be able to remember when we got home. And so I did. I kept all of these really careful notes because I wanted to remember what it was like to be at the Eiffel Tower. And I wanted to remember what it was like to be on the south of France. I wanted to keep those memories. And I took a lot of pictures on an actual camera where you actually printed out the film And I actually thought I'd go back and look at them. And I actually have no idea where that is now. But man, did I do an awesome job on that scrapbook. (laughs) And I don't remember a lot of things about the trip now. A, because I can't find the scrapbook. And B, because I'm middle-aged. But I think we've covered some of this ground already. (laughs) But you realize God doesn't ever have to remember what the Eiffel Tower is like. Because he's there. He doesn't have to buy a postcard. He doesn't have to keep a travel log. He's at the Eiffel Tower, and he's here, and he's in China, and he is everywhere fully present. And even then, if you want your head to explode a little bit more, he's everywhere fully present in the past and in the future. Ties in with the eternality. I don't know anyone like that, but I tell you what, there are days when I wish that I could be like that because there are some things I'd like to control. And I don't want to have a limit of place, and that's exactly what this body is that I'm in. It tells me that I can only be in one place at one time, but I rail against that, right? And I come up with ways to make it feel at least like I can be in more more than one place at one time. I use my DVR or I FaceTime or whatever it is that I need to do to make myself feel like I can get myself in more than one place. And then what happens? Of course, I end up feeling like I'm not present in any one place at all. But God, by contrast, is everywhere fully present. There is not a piece of him here and a piece of him in China. 
I don't know anyone like that. That makes me want to worship. So we move on. We haven't even gotten to the part that the women talk about all the time, but we're getting there now. Verse 13. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. And that a reference there to God as self-existent. He is the one who creates. He creates and sustains life. Verse 14, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And you notice here who the focus is of verse 14, right? It's actually not me fearfully and wonderfully made. It turns out that it's actually God fearful and wonderful. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And there are reference to God's omnipotence, his works, his mighty works. He is able to even knit life together in the secret place where it is darkness, but all darkness is as light to him. Verse 15, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. So now we've moved on from hearing that God is the creator of life and that he is all-powerful to this idea that he is sovereign. He numbers our days. That's sort of a saying that we've picked up on. We use it as a threat, right? Your days are numbered. We say that to the bad child. Your days are numbered. We use it as a threat, but really for us it is the greatest comfort that we can know, isn't it? I don't know if anybody in here has had a health scare. It seems to be the nature of life that at some point you will have one if you haven't already. I know that I had one early on in life and how important it was to me to know as I was walking into a doctor appointment that nothing that a doctor could say to me could change the number of the days that I had. That he could tell me things that I didn't know about the state of my health, but what he could not do is shorten the days of my life. Why? Because those rested in the hand of a sovereign God. A God who has determined exactly how many days that I need to accomplish what it is that he has for me to do. And I don't know about you, but there are people in my life over whom I would like to have sovereign control. I would like to make sure, not just that I have power over them, but that I use it in such a way that determines the course of their lives. And this has been one of the things that, as a parent of teenagers, I have become increasingly aware of. Because let's face it, when your children are babies, you know every single thing, about every single thing. I remember keeping a chart of what was coming out in their diapers and keeping a corresponding chart of what was going into their mouths. And there was just a high level of control there. And I felt like if I could just measure all those things and keep everything in the right place, I can raise the perfect child. There is a, there is a formula involving formula which will get my child to a place where they will be the perfect child ever. All I have to do is just work this, this formula here. And I, I liked it. You know, as, you, as your children grow, even by the time they're age two, you start to realize, oh gosh, I think I don't have the same level of control I did when they were strapped to me all the time. And now they're licking the sockets, and they are trying to eat poison 24 hours a day. And as they get older, what do we realize? This relinquishing of control, just more and more control handed over. And so now we've hit the phase with our children, the consulting phase. I'm for it, but I still have days where I think, could you just do what I want? Because that would be better. And it's much of, the, much of the difficulty of being a mother of late teenage parents is just not saying that, right? It's just sitting on it and just trying to think it quietly, but knowing I don't control them. Either they have an internal mechanism for choosing right and wrong at this point, or they don't. But it's not my job to hover, and it's not my job to control. But here's God with all power and completely capable, and not only that, but infinitely wise, which is something that I'm not. Like, I might say this is the way walk in it to my children, but I'm doing so based on limited knowledge and on limited power and very limited wisdom. But God holds all knowledge and all power, and therefore he is infinitely qualified to be sovereign and to ordain the number of our days and to ordain the purpose of our lives. So David chooses to celebrate that and to worship it. And he moves on from there, and he says in verse 17, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. 
And so here he pulls into focus the infinitude of God, that God is immeasurable. And catch the irony of what he is saying here, because think about how he has just described himself in relation to God. He is measurable. He is quantifiable. His thoughts are able to be known. The number of his days is mapped out. We know other places in Scripture talk about how God knows the number of hairs on our head. We are quantifiable. If we were to step on a scale, you would know how much we weighed. If we were to be measured against the wall with a yardstick, you would know exactly how tall we are. We are limited. We are a set of limits. And he has laid that out for us in the beginning of the psalm. And now he turns and says, but you, God, you are vast. Your thoughts are countless. They're more than the sand. He is infinite and he is immeasurable. And so our tendency to want to control things through measurement is something that God defies at every turn. What is the proper response to this kind of a God? So we said that awe was supposed to generate a response in us, but what is it? We said that it made us other-focused. That's what, that's what scientists are saying. People who've done research in the field say that when we feel genuine awe, it turns our eyes from ourselves and it focuses them on other people. But how does this happen? Let's see what David's response to awe is as we get into verse 19, which is a section of the psalm which, as I mentioned, the ladies usually skip past. What does it say in verse 19? Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Okay, so how much hatred did it say that he feels toward his enemies? complete hatred, okay? So it's this the group hug doesn't work really well in this section of the psalm, but just hang on. So think about David. Think about David. He had actual physical enemies coming against him. They were the enemies not just of David, but they were the enemies of God. And so when we read this, it is appropriate for David to feel a complete hatred towards those who hate the truth. But what about you and me? Do we have physical enemies coming against us? What does Ephesians 6.12 say about our enemies? That our battle is not against flesh and blood as David's was. Our battle is a spiritual battle. Romans 8.13 says that we are to put to death the deeds of the body. 1 Peter 2.11 says that we are to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against our souls. So who is our battle against? I mean, it's really against the world, the flesh, and the devil, to put it the way the New Testament authors often do. We have to do battle with sin. And so what awe should inspire in us is this complete hatred of personal sin, that we see a vision of God high and lifted up, and our response is similar to that of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, where we immediately have a sense of our own sinfulness and cry out, woe is me. Because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Does our conception of God cause a complete hatred of sin in us? Because if it doesn't, then it lacks awe. It lacks awe. Our battle is not against flesh and blood and we are called to take up the armor of God every day and do battle against those very real enemies that are making war against our soul. And as John Owen once said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. And so we take it seriously and we do battle against it. Because think about it. What if I woke up every morning, contemplated the awe of God and turned and hated selfishness in my life? What if I hated self-centeredness? What if I hated self-sufficiency? What if I turned all of my energy on rooting those sins out, calling them what they are in the light of day, and eradicating them from my life? How do you think that the eradication of those sins would affect my relationships with other people? Don't you think I would better be able to fulfill the great command? Wouldn't I essentially be putting to death narcissism every day when I wake up? And becoming more others focused, as the great command would tell me to do. And look at the end of this psalm, what the end result is 
for David of contemplating the holiness and the otherness of God and seeing himself in relation to it. Verse 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. It's interesting because what did he start with in verse 1? O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. And here at the very end of this psalm, he comes back and says, Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Why? What does he know? He knows that this process of hating sin, of seeing himself in relation to a God who is like no other, is one that needs to be repetitive and ongoing. That during this lifetime, he will never reach the end of seeing himself in relation to God. And this is such an important thing for us to understand. This is why when I ask women to read the Bible differently, and I ask them to look first for what the Bible says about God, this is why it's such an important exercise. Because the knowledge of self and the knowledge of God always go hand in hand. In fact, there is no true knowledge of self apart from the knowledge of God. Because as long as I am only measuring myself in terms of other people, I will always find someone who I can sit next to me and say, oh, well, sure, I'm not the most merciful person in the world, but this guy, he's really bad at it. Or, yeah, I know, I should hold my tongue more than I do, but oh my gosh, do you know what she's like? She never shuts up. And it's not until I lay myself against the infinitely good, the infinitely truthful, the infinitely merciful, gracious, and just measuring rod that is God himself, that I understand who I truly am. And then what? I'm able to cry out to God and say, help me, change me. I don't want to be like this anymore. So if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom... And then it follows that the fear of man is the beginning of folly, doesn't it? And the thing that I've come to realize that is perhaps most convicting about looking at what is true only of God and then wanting it to be true of me is that when I do try to become God in my various spheres of influence, a terrible thing happens. Other people commend me for it. When I want to be self-sufficient, when I want to have no needs, a thing that is only true of our Heavenly Father, and when I begin to behave in such a way as to make me be independent from other people, you know what people tell me? Oh my gosh, you're so strong. You're such a hard worker. When I want to deny the fact that I am not self-sustaining, when I want to say, I don't need rest, I'll just keep working. When I try to ascribe to myself something that's true only of God, people celebrate that and they tell me, you know what, you should have a, you should have a promotion. And when I try to overmanage the lives of my children or my spouse or my coworkers because I'm constantly offering them the better path, you know what people say? Wow, you're so wise, you're so caring. And so, so often the our attempts to become like God don't draw on us the rebuke that they should. Instead, they draw on us the favor of those who don't acknowledge that God in the first place. And help and help us, sometimes even when the community of faith, people celebrate these things about us. Sometimes we ask our Christian leaders to be God-like instead of just to be humans serving a God who is like no other. That's a chilling thought for me. Because I think, yeah, I could work that. I could work that to my own glory. I could turn so many passages around to where they have more to say about me than they do about God. And I could live a life that is devoid of awe and that makes much of me. And the end thereof is death. But what a great pursuit for us to turn daily. Because this was the thing that was so interesting about the article that I read that had to do with how we experience awe. It said that really what we need, if we're to cure this narcissistic tendency within just our society as a whole, you know what it said? We should look for daily doses of awe. All right, that's great, except I live in Dallas, Texas, and the topography is not that awe-inspiring. So if you live on the rim of the Grand Canyon, I would say you're probably in good shape to get your daily dose of awe if we're talking about natural revelation You can walk out every morning and stare out at the Grand Canyon and be reminded that there is a God and you are not him and that he is spectacular. What about the rest of us? I mean, the Grand Canyon is a great place to go if you want to learn something that's true about God that should be evident to all people. 
But you and I, as the community of faith, as those who believe in Jesus Christ and attest to him as our Savior, we have something that is drawn in a fine tip pen that tells us about the nature and character of God in a way that can only be hinted at as we gaze out at the splendors of creation. We have his word. We have right in here all that we would ever need to keep us with our daily dose of awe for the 70 or 80 years that the Lord provides us on this earth. How important do you think it is to spend time here? So there are these things that are only true about God, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his omnipresence, all of these things that we try to mimic, just like Adam and Eve in the garden who reached out for a fruit that promised what? That you will become like him. And yet all the time we are being held out these other fruits. Maybe you know them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These fruits that are being held out to us and said, this is the way, walk in it. And we dare not be so consumed with trying to become like God in ways we can never be like him, that we neglect to become formed to the image of his son in ways that would transform our homes and our churches and our communities, every sphere that we inhabit. And so my prayer for each of you is that you would live a life that bespeaks the awe that David gives us here in Psalm 139. That you would know the God who is fearful and wonderful in such a way that you long for the fruit that is ours to have and you touch not the fruit that is not intended for us. That in all things we might see the Lord glorified. And that if there is anything for us to put our hand to and bless, it would be the words of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul, let all that is in me bless his holy name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess to you that we lack the fear of the Lord and consequently lack wisdom. Lord, we confess to you that we want to be you instead of become like you in ways that are good and right. Lord, speak your truth to our hearts. Give us a vision of you high and lifted up. Lord, every time we turn to your word, may we not go there looking to see ourselves before we go there looking to see you. We pray, Lord, that it would be our experience to have a daily dose of awe gazing upon who you are, and being brought to right worship. And we ask all these things in the name of your Son. Amen.